Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have Adam here. How are you doing, Adam? I'm great, Andy. Looking forward to today's show. It's been a long week, um, and we're just going to dive right into our show today. We're going to talk about single sign-on and self-service password reset. So before we tackle the conditional access discussion that we were promising you guys, we wanted to first talk about single sign-on. When most people get a cloud identity provider, the reason is usually because of a single sign-on capability. And that's where you can use the cloud identity to sign into multiple different SaaS applications. Consumers should be familiar with this type of workflow because there are multiple different types of sign-ons that you can use as a single sign-on in your consumer life. For example, I'm sure you've come across a website where you can sign in using your Google account or sign in using your Facebook account. Or more recently, sign in with Apple. Apple now has gotten into this game and they're pushing it really hard too. Yep. And while this pod is about enterprise security, a lot of what we talk about can be applied in the consumer and personal side. As a side note, I just wanted to kind of tell a story because my oldest son recently got a G Suite account in Chromebook for his school. And one of the things that they did initially was they set all the passwords for their entire class to the same password, third grade. And when he showed me the password, of course, I was like, well, we got to change that to something different. And he actually got yelled at by his teacher because he changed his password. And I sent an email to the teacher saying, you know, we should educate our kids starting at this age about cybersecurity and teach them what constitutes a good password because these kids are growing up with technology and if we teach them that third grade is a good password and that's the same password as every kid in this in the class then that's not setting them up for success later on and of course mfa wasn't enabled and my kid is pretty good when it comes to technology and so he started navigating different web pages and these websites that he went to he started signing in with his g suite account with oauth And I had to educate him because I told him, you know, if you have a weak password and you don't have MFA enabled, then when you're signing into all these different websites, if your Google account gets compromised, then the attacker is going to have access to all the different sites that you've used Google to sign into. And I showed him on the Google page where he's authorized all these different apps. And so we went through and we removed a bunch of them, you know, in my personal life. And I taught him this too, which is kind of the opposite of what you do from an enterprise standpoint. But I create an individual login for every single website that I go to, and I don't use OAuth. Do you use OAuth in your personal life, Adam? Since I use a password manager, and I know you do too, Andy, I try not to. Since I have a password manager, it's easier to just create different accounts anyway. And like you said, now you're reducing this chain of compromise where if somebody were to gain access to my Google account, they now have access to a ton of my stuff. I still do use it occasionally, but in general, it's easier for me to remember if I just build an account for everything as much as possible. So I kind of try to avoid it. And it really depends. Because I know I have done it from time to time, I am really fanatically focused on hardening my Google account because I have done OAuth in some situations or there's some places where that's the only way to do it. And I also use Gmail as my email account. So I understand that that's kind of the keys to the kingdom for me. If you can compromise that, you could probably you know have cascading impacts for me because you can do forget password flows and all that sort of thing. So anyhow, I'm really fanatical about hardening that versus anything else. So if you do use OAuth, you got to be really, really careful. Make sure that account has MFA enabled and that you're using all the security controls as much as possible. And then you may even consider disabling SMS two-factor authentication on that account um, as well and rely on other things like one-time password MFAs or or FIDO keys or, or something like that instead. But anyways, we digress from the personal side. Like I said, it's a little bit different where OAuth can be a vulnerability from your personal side, whereas from an enterprise side, we actually do want to onboard all of those different apps and sign in with the same identity provider. And there's a lot of different identity providers out there like Microsoft, Azure AD, Okta, Ping. There are a few that are emerging from the market, but all of these cloud identity providers, you can onboard that identity and use your login from that identity to sign into, say, Dropbox or 
Microsoft or Box, Salesforce, or other SaaS apps that you have. And sometimes people get confused when you say Azure AD can do that because they think you're talking about Active Directory Federated Services or ADFS, and that supports this as well, but they're not the same thing. So in general, Microsoft is encouraging customers to move their single sign-on federation away from ADFS and toward Azure Azure AD, um, but both can do it. So just have an awareness there. Think of one as more of kind of the on-prem solution that you manage yourself versus Azure AD is much more of a cloud-managed solution where you kind of just set it and forget it. I didn't realize that Azure AD had a bunch of applications built in, just like Okta and Ping and other IDPs have applications that are built in that you can just onboard. And of course, there's custom apps as well that you can build to build the single sign-on. But that was news to me, Adam, it was you who told me that Azure AD can provide this capability. So if you're an Okta shop or you're a Ping shop or you use some other IDP and you own Azure AD, it's included in your office licensing that you can use it for an identity provider and single sign-on solution. Actually, nowadays, um, this is a recent change. If you just want to set up single sign-on in Azure AD and you don't need a lot of the other premium features, which if you're listening to this podcast, you do. But if you do just want to set up single sign-on and import some user identities, that's totally free. You don't need any license to pay Microsoft a dime. Uh, You want to import user identities, do single sign-on to federated apps in the app gallery. It's table stakes at this point. So that's kind of a recent change as well. And for our security review at my company, every time someone comes through with a request for another SaaS application for us to review the security and the requirements, we don't recommend the application unless it has SAML integration for an IDP. If it does not have that, that is a huge red flag. It's either a new app or an app that just doesn't look at security in general. If it doesn't have some sort of SAML integration, we turn it down or we recommend that the business look at something else. Right. That's where we kind of get into the you know security team's job is to advise on the risk level. And just the, by the nature of not having that, the overall risk posture of the application is going to be enhanced. But if it's something you just have to have, then sometimes it's just a, a risk you have to accept. And I know in Azure AD, there is still the option to essentially do password vaulting with it, where those applications that don't support SAML, you can vault that password. And then there's an Azure AD plugin that is available for Microsoft Edge and Google Chrome, and it'll just plug the password in automatically from Azure AD, and you can target specific users in your organization that can have access to that. So that's an option as well. Again, probably something to avoid and use minimally, but it is there in the circumstances where you need it. Yeah, we use Okta, my company, and Okta has the same feature, except it's mostly a bookmark and saves it very similar to how like your Chrome browser would save a password. And it provides, I would say, a false sense of single sign-on because for the user, it looks like they're signing in, right? They go to their apps page and they have a bookmark or the application tile and they can click on it. But on the back end, the sign-in is actually still with the SaaS app and not with the identity provider. Right. Still better than, than nothing because for the user experience, it's one pain and hopefully that application gets SAML signed in at some point. You know, most importantly, why should you make this a focus in your organization? You know, what are some reasons that single sign on every time an app comes through that we require SAML sign in? And one of them is specifically shadow IT. So when you have all of these departments within your organization that may have the ability to procure different SaaS apps, a lot of times, they are not associated with security or they don't check with security. So they'll go out and buy an app and then they'll manage it on their own. They'll manage the licensing and the user provisioning within that app. And if the user leaves because it hasn't been onboarded into the identity provider, the user may get disabled within AD or within the identity provider, but then they have to go into the individual app and revoke those permissions too. And if they don't do that, then that user who has been technically offboarded will still have access because it's a SaaS app. It's available in the cloud and anywhere they go. And if it's something that's particularly sensitive, for example, in security, we have a lot of SaaS apps like our EDR solution and our our email gateway and our vulnerability assessment tool, all those are within the cloud. And if I were to be terminated and those apps were not onboarded with our IDP, then I would still have access to all of that information anywhere that has internet access. I think another point too, kind of piggybacking what you're talking about is sometimes 
people don't know it's wrong, or they can at least kind of pretend they didn't know it was wrong to stand up this shadow IT to just go buy it with a procurement card and you know manage it themselves in, in their little business unit. If you as an organization are fanatical about making every application run through your IDP, using SAML integration as much as possible, when an application pops up that doesn't run through that, it's going to set off that little light bulb above somebody's head and say, something's not right about this. Maybe I should report it. Maybe we should talk to IT about it so we can get it loaded in there. And that can help you encourage that kind of behavior and and getting it in the right place and getting it managed the right way for all of the risk you just described, Andy. And kind of on that note as well, uh, this is one area of opportunity for cloud access security brokers. If you have a CASB, a lot of them, one of their major functions is shadow IT discovery. And a good CASB, I know Microsoft Cloud App Security does this, it can actually categorize which apps your users are using by if they do or do not support SAML. So you can really break that out and discover which apps maybe you could onboard to your IDP that you just haven't versus uh, which ones you're just not going to be able to support at all. And that can help you make some of those decisions too. One of the things that came up this week as I was preparing the show notes for this conversation was I discovered one of our high-level executives was using a personal cloud storage application that was not onboarded with our IDP using his company credentials, his his company email, I should say. And that's concerning because with anyone in the company, but of course at an executive level, it's it's very concerning because in general, the behavior of most employees is if you're not onboarding the SaaS app with your IDP and they have to create a credential for something that is a cloud app, they're going to use their company email. And then most likely they will be using the password that they use to access your other cloud applications or the network or the computer. They're going to use the same password that they use for the company that they do for this SaaS application. But technically it's it's a whole nother login. It's not associated with your identity provider. And of course that's concerning because if that SaaS app gets compromised, now you have a combination for that email address and password that's out there and they will try it, of course, against your environment. And if you didn't listen to our episode on enable MFA and you're one of the companies that haven't enabled MFA, once you have that password and email combination, now you have access to all of your SaaS app because it's the same as your identity provider, right? That's the danger of having applications that are not onboarded with your IDP because users are going to reuse their their username and password and it's going to be the same as the one that you're using for your company. Quick side note here, people will reuse their passwords as much as they possibly can, and you should have controls in place to mitigate that. So I don't want to get way off topic here, but just as an awareness piece, in many IDPs, I know in Azure AD, you can do this. If you have password hash synchronization turned on in Azure AD, Microsoft will automatically acquire password dumps from the dark web, from government agencies, from threat intel sources, and will compare them against your user password hashes. So if something like this happens, like Andy's describing where, um, say, a user reused their corporate credential password for their Dropbox account, and then that gets dumped on the dark web, Microsoft would hopefully catch that before anybody else and would notify you that this user had, in fact, a compromised credential. And then you can even, if you have the highest level of identity protection with Azure AD, have an automatic flow to do self-service password reset, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute. So that's interesting tie-in there. But just as a a side note on a defense in-depth strategy, obviously we want to try to do single sign-on because we will limit options for your users to reuse their credentials, but they likely will anyway in their personal life. So having controls to mitigate that is helpful as well. And Andy, one more thing that I don't think you touched on here, but is relevant as well. For a lot of these uh, SaaS applications, they are not licensed to be used for like commercial enterprise purposes on their free tier. So if you sign up for, and and I'm not familiar with like the EULA for Dropbox or Box off the top of my head, and you're using a whole bunch of free accounts, um, that's sometimes against the terms of their license agreement, because if you're using it for commercial purposes, you have to have the associated commercial account. And I actually know from my past life in IT, Box did come after us because we had a whole bunch of employees who had personal 
free box account set up with their corporate email. And they noticed after we had, you know, 20 or 30 people set one up and they came after us and basically said, you need to buy an enterprise license for these users, or we're going to do something. And I don't know what the something was, but that's, a, that's another concern too, is um, when you have this stood up properly and you're meeting all your user needs, then that will discourage them from doing this and potentially putting your company in a precarious legal position. Dropbox did the same thing at a previous company of mine. A lot of users were creating accounts, free accounts with our company email, and they also noticed and they they reached out to us, their legal team and and our legal team had a discussion and we ended up buying enterprise agreements uh, with Dropbox to onboard those folks. And then what happens a lot of times with these SaaS apps is once you acquire the proper licensing and onboard it with your IDP, those free accounts can be converted over to enterprise accounts. So it can be done seamlessly seamlessly without having to interrupt the user or move the contents if it's a cloud storage one like we're talking about here Dropbox the contents that account can just be converted over and onboarded onto the single sign on solution without any user impact picking your identity provider and onboarding apps with single sign-on is a crucial decision point in your security journey. And I say that because one of the things single sign-on leads to is conditional access. And conditional access, as we'll get into later on in one of our subsequent shows, is kind of the holy grail when it comes to making sure that users are following configurations that security has approved. If you pick an identity provider that doesn't necessarily have conditional access built in, then you're just setting yourself up later on for probably a weaker position when it comes to identity. I would argue one thing that's really important when you look at this, and and again, we're going to do a whole show on this, but just to kind of set the stage here, is the ability to do conditional access from the perspective of look for things like what network are you coming from? What's your risk level? Like that's all important. And I'm not being dismissive of that. That really matters. And being able to separate it depending on what OS you're using, or if you're using a thick client versus a web browser, that all matters. But one thing you should really consider and really try to drive toward is that interplay of device management and identity management. When you make device part of your identity story, it gets exponentially stronger because then you can do very interesting things like consider considering the device's health, its compliance state, its threat level as part of making that access decision. So now you can get really, really interesting where your IDP, before somebody can get access to your Salesforce instance or your Workday instance, they must be on a managed device that is healthy, like encryption is working correctly, Secure Boot's working correctly, and the EDR solution is reporting that there is no active threat on the device. And if any of that changes, Secure Boot gets disabled, BitLocker breaks, there's an active threat on the device, access gets cut off to, again, a Workday or Salesforce. That is super, super powerful, well beyond just implementing some sort of MFA, well beyond doing some sort of control around what IP range you're coming from. That's that's really kind of the holy grail is when you're integrating device management and identity management together. So strongly look at that as you make your IDP decisions, because that I think is where you really need to get to, because that breaks a lot of attacks out there. For example, Evil Jinx 2 won't work if you're using this device-based model. And that's one of those like man-in-the-middle proxy kind of attacks. And this is more of a tactical decision versus a strategic decision. Because tactically, let's say you have a bunch of SaaS apps that you need to gain control of. You have a bunch of shadow IT that's going on. They have individual logins using your company email, and you need to get a hold on that. Tactically, getting an IDP and onboarding them to single sign-on is the way to fix it. But strategically, when you think about it three years down the line or even sooner, when you have a SaaS app that's onboarded with an IDP, what Adam is talking about where you don't have a way to control it on what device it may be on is the problem with our security in the 21st century or during COVID. Because people are working from home, they want to work on their own device. And take the Dropbox or Box example. If you onboard it with a third-party identity provider that doesn't have conditional access built in, then you can install that client on any computer that you have valid credentials for. As long as your credentials are valid with the identity provider, you can authenticate to it, you can install Box or Dropbox or OneDrive even on any computer and connect company data to it. Even if that computer is a personal computer and full of malware or doesn't have disk encryption or doesn't have a valid up-to-date AV 
because you're, as long as you have those valid credentials, you're golden and you can authenticate and pull that data down. Where you start to shine is when you start applying conditional access, where the credentials are valid. So we check that, but then we check the device and see if the device is encrypted or if you have a password to get into the operating system. And if you don't, then we deny access to that application. And we'll talk more about conditional access and how that works. But I just wanted to give you an idea because one of the things that I ran into when I was using Okta at our current company was the integration between that and an MDM solution called Mass360. The biggest issue was how do you get somebody to enroll a device into an MDM solution, a mobile device management solution, without walking them through it or sitting them down saying, I'm going to put your device in MDM. You want a way to prompt the user to say, you have to enroll now without you sitting it down administratively and saying, we're going to walk you through this. And when I tried to integrate conditional access, which there was a method that they provided us to do it, but it was very complicated because we had to pass the authentication token from Okta over to Mass360s or IBM's identity provider. So it just so happens that IBM had their own identity provider that also does the same thing as Okta and Ping and, and Azure. AD, but we had to pass that authentication token over from Okta over to Mass360, and then Mass360 would then check the condition of the device. And so the integration part was extremely complicated. And then on top of that, even though it worked, it couldn't manage any device outside of devices that weren't enrolled in Master 60, which is an obvious statement, but the biggest issue was Windows devices. If you are going to manage personal Windows devices, let's say you want to put an application on a personal Windows device and you want to make sure that that device has the configuration that you deem is safe, then that has to be enrolled in Master 360. But what else are Windows devices other than personal devices? Your enterprise devices. And so the only way to manage the enterprise devices was to also enroll them in Master 60, which that was not going to happen, right? We're managing those through Configuration Manager and, and other means. But that became the deal breaker where we had to check conditions for personal devices, make sure that those met the conditions that we wanted to put company data on. But in order for Windows to work, they would have to enroll our enterprise devices. Andy, I think I'm going to take that last three minutes and just replay that to all my customers as a Azure AD plus Intune sales pitch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's Intune can do a lot of things, right? I mean, when it comes down to trying to manage devices across all operating systems, Intune is probably your only option, mainly because it can manage enterprise Windows 10 devices along with personal Windows 10 devices iOS, Android, DEP devices, along with the Samsung Knox ones and personal devices. You know, you have a single pane into all of that. And oh, by the way, it's included with your M365 E3 licensing, right? If you had M365 E3 or EMS, it's included with that. Right. Most customers who own Azure AD also own that. It's pretty rare that you don't. They're usually sold together. So no, I, I was just cracking a joke there. But the point you just made was very a good example of the importance of integrating device and identity. Even if it's hard, it's still worth doing, which is what it sounds like you did at your organization. And again, I think this is something we'll talk about a lot more in our conditional access episode. But we're, we keep coming back to it just because it's so important to realize the benefits you get when you set up all your single sign-on apps in your identity provider and you get all these extra levers and controls it helps really harden and secure them. And that's why kind of going back to the top of the show, we are comparing what you do in personal life versus what you do in corporate IT. Why it is safe and a good idea to do single sign-on is because of all the additional access controls we can wrap around it. And I think that's a really solid point to kind of end on here. So then we wanted to add a little bullet point about self-service password reset because that can also tie into conditional access later on where you have compromised passwords and risk-based, user-based conditional access. Self-service password reset in general is usually a feature within an identity provider. Third-party identity providers will have them. Azure AD has a feature for self-service password reset. And where it comes in to security mainly is when a user wants to reset their password, how do you identify that user to be that user, right? Security questions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use security questions. 
Right. I mean, it's but but most importantly, you know, at, at smaller companies or or even larger companies, you know, if if a user needs to reset their password and they don't know their password, I think that's the most important part of it. Because if they know their password, most of the time you can just reset the password. You really that's not really a re- password reset. It's more of a changing of the password. Mm-hmm. But if you truly don't know your password, and a lot of times what happens is you change your password and then you forget what you changed it to, and then you need a password reset is usually the most common scenario. In that case at a lot of companies who haven't implemented self-service password reset, they call into their help desk. And the help desk has to ask them some sort of question. Usually, maybe they have a process in place. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just take the person's word at, at it and say, okay, I'll set reset this person's password. And then what do you reset it to, right? Do you have a process to say, I'm going to reset it to, you know, Packers one exclamation mark or some, you know, probably usually the company name, the year (laughs) exclamation mark is usually what it's reset to is, is my guess. So you probably don't have a, a secure method of identifying the caller. You probably don't have a secure password that you're resetting it to. And then how are you sending the, the password to the user? Are you saying it over the phone? Or are you sending it through email? And so all of these considerations, right, are if you don't have self-service password reset. So basically what I'm saying is this is a great security feature because it allows the user to reset their own password without having to have all of these different security holes that I'm talking about. Also, money. This is literally a way you can pay for your identity provider by itself at a lot of organizations because the amount of money your company spends on having the help desk do password resets is probably in the six figures. And I am not joking. It is stupid how much companies spend on help desk password reset. And so this right here, if you can stand up SSPR and get it going and significantly reduce your call volumes to your help desk will literally save you six figures and put that money towards a good IDP. One of the implementation things that I do want to add to the self-service password reset conversation is start thinking about how you manage your computers. This is more of an infrastructure discussion rather than security, but security ties into it because Microsoft has multiple ways of joining devices to management, whether it be domain joined or Azure AD joined or hybrid Azure AD joined. Most companies, I'm guessing, are domain joined machines. And so when you use a self-service password reset feature, which is cloud, and you're resetting a password for domain joined machine, you're going to usually reset the password for the cloud. And then it usually will sync back down to probably your AD controller through some connection in that you've set up either an LDAP lookup or, or something on the back end. But how does that password get back to the machine that the user is trying to sign into? It's going to be very difficult, which is what I'm trying to get at, because the credentials for their old password was cached, and it has to have line of sight to the domain controller, which usually means some sort of VPN, in order to update that password. And unless you have device-based VPN and not a user-based VPN, meaning device-based establishes the tunnel prior to the user logging into the operating system, the device itself creates a tunnel and can establish connection to the domain controller, then you're kind of out of luck because if the user can't sign in and they can't remember their old password, they can't establish the VPN connection. So really the only way to reset the cached credentials is to log in using a local administrator, usually the built-in administrator. And so you have to have a solution for managing the credentials for the local administrator. And we'll get into that with our on-prem AD discussion, but I just wanted to add that as one of the more complicated issues when it comes to managing devices on-prem versus the more futuristic way of Azure AD joining devices because those devices are connected to the cloud. And so when you reset your password, it'll contact Azure and pull those credentials down. So this has come up all the time right now for me in my work at Microsoft. Customers are reaching out to us a lot. Hey, we want to stand up self-service password reset. We have people who are not able to sign into their devices and Microsoft solution can integrate itself in the login screen on Windows 10, on Windows 7, on Windows 8. And so that would be awesome. They can click forget my password and reset their password and they'll be good, right? Uh, No, because if their device still doesn't have line of sight to the domain controller, this still isn't going to help. You can get that password reset on the domain controller, and that's great, but you still have to get that line of sight, which, like Andy said, is either take it in the office or local administrator stand up VPN kind of thing. So it's, it's a real challenge, and this is definitely useful technology, but it does not solve this specific pain point. So what I would encourage you to do, as long as this pain is fresh in your mind, use this as the catalyst 
to start cutting the umbilical cord of domain join devices. And again, this is definitely a conversation for another show. But of what Andy said, hybrid join devices are still going to have the same problem because they still try to communicate their sign-in to your on-premises domain controller. The only solution that is completely cloud-native is an Azure AD join device. And you can do that and still have access to on-prem resources. You can still manage it with SCCM or MECM as it's called nowadays. But the only thing you can't do, which is the big hangup for people, is GPO. And there's ways to solve that now as well, where you can dump all your GPOs into Intune and it will spit out the equivalent controls. So this is kind of becoming a solved problem where you can migrate to this model. So really consider if you still want to be deploying devices in a way where they are completely dependent on line of sight to a device that sits inside your corporate network and ask yourself if that makes sense for you in 2021 and beyond. Because some organizations are already back in the office and just kind of, you know, whatever. Um, Some organizations are still very much completely work from home and will be for quite some time and may have hybrid kind of workplace forever moving forward where a lot of people work from home a lot of the time. If that's true of you, then it might be time to start you know, moving away from that model. So SSPR doesn't fix that and be aware of those limitations because everything Andy said is spot on. This, this isn't necessarily going to solve that. One other point I wanted to make as well is with some identity providers, and I know this is true of Azure AD and I'm sure it's true of others, the security information registration experience. So when you're like signing up for your MFA um, devices like phone call or text message, And Azure AD, at least, can integrate your self-service password reset security methods as well. So the user only goes through the wizard one time, but it makes sure that they have registered enough devices, whether that's email accounts, whether that's phone calls, text messages, office phone, hardware tokens, FIDO keys, etc., that they will be able to reset their password and perform MFA. And so you can tie all of that together in kind of one neat solution. So benefit to deploying SSPR if you're already doing MFA can make it so that it's really not additional effort for your users. They kind of get two for the price of one. Well, that's our show for this week. There's a link in the show notes to our voicemail. Leave us a voicemail or send us a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn if there's a security topic you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on. Thanks and talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.